Hello and welcome to another set of notes in our unit on abnormal psychology and the treatment of abnormal psychology. We are rolling right along and going to talk about both personality disorders and dissociative disorders in this set of notes. Remember um, to have your paper notes in front of you that you can find in my Teachers Pay Teachers store because it'll kind of follow right along in what we're talking about in this in these slides. First, we're going to talk about dissociative disorders. It's important for you to know that this, um, these two categories are, in fact, different categories. So we have personality disorders, which there are a lot of, and we're going to talk about. But then dissociative disorders is a different category in the DSM-5. So we're going to talk about dissociative disorders first. It's important for you to know the meaning of dissociation. Think of it as like daydreaming or getting lost in the moment while working on a project. These are kind of examples of anybody and everybody that can kind of dissociate almost as if they're breaking from a critical part of their personality, like memory, consciousness, or identity that are normally integrated and work together. So temporary dissociative states are common for us. So again, don't think it's just disordered behavior. Some examples are when you're driving a common route, like to school or to work, one that you do frequently, and you realize that you don't recall going through an intersection, or if you even stopped at a stop sign, or if you're on a longer road trip and you don't remember the last few miles because you've been so up in your head and not thinking about the moment, I guess you could say. So the biggest disorder that we'll talk about in this category is dissociative identity disorder. This is previously known as multiple personality disorder. So recall what we just talked about with the meaning of dissociation, breaking from or separating a part of one's personality, right? Well, that makes sense here. Again, it's not a personality disorder, though. It's a dissociative disorder because it's a break in personality. So it's a condition in which a person appears to have two or more distinct personalities, each of which can speak, act, and write in different ways. So different identities also seem to have their own memories, wishes, and impulses. And often the impulses of one identity conflict with the other identities really interesting stuff. Problems occur because there is only one body available, duh, um, for the different personalities. So it forces the personalities to take turns. Because there can be such strong variations in personalities, a person's behavior when looked at overall can appear very inconsistent. So when you're from the outside looking at person at someone with dissociative identity disorder, you just see these huge fluctuations in behavior. Very radical, right? Um, very erratic, I guess you could say. So Again, those huge fluctuations is kind of like um, a characteristic because you don't necessarily know right away that there's multiple personalities. Herschel Walker in the book called Breaking Free is a former NFL running back who delves into his excruciating struggles with DID, saying he tried to manage a dozen personalities throughout his life and that he had one personality for each aspect, one where he was a f loving father, one where he was a cutthroat football player, right? One where he was a businessman. So um, just you just never know, right? Um, famous cases of DID include in the 50s, Chris Sizemore um, was made into a movie, The Three Faces of Eve. And then three of Chris's 22 distinct personalities were to depicted in the book and movie, referred to by doctors as Eve White, Eve Black, and the intellectual Jane. And you can kind of read about the differences in those personalities. The really famous case is Sybil. So her name was Shirley Mason. Also in the early 50s, she was a substitute teacher and a student at Columbia University. She had long suffered from blackouts and emotional breakdowns. Again, this is characteristic of DID because her like Sybil, her true identity and personality blacks out and goes unconscious when the other personalities come through. And then these emotional breakdowns being because of all the break, the blackouts, but also because of the huge fluctuations in her behavior and emotions. Um, so she entered psychotherapy with Cornelia B. Wilbur, a Freudian psychiatrist. 
Um, and so Mason later moved to Lexington, Kentucky, where she taught art classes and ran an art gallery out of her home for many years. And then this just gives you a quick rundown of the many personalities of Sybil. One is even a baby, um, right? And then some are even different, the opposite sex, right? Some are even male. So there really are no bounds to, to the, the variations in the personalities. The development of DID, how does someone have this, right? So there's different perspectives. The psychoanalytic is that there's massive repression of unwanted impulses or memories. And the person creates a new person who acts out otherwise unacceptable impulses or recalls otherwise unbearable memories. So this is just the idea, the idea that the true identity can't handle what it is that's happening or what it is that they're remembering. So this other personality is created that allows them to deal with it. That doesn't mean it's healthy. It just means that they deal with it. And then a behaviorist says that everyone's capable of acting in different ways in different situations. So this disorder is the extreme variation of acting so differently that you feel like a different person. And therefore, when you're in that situation, you just naturally through... Um, um, through just conditioning and those associations, right? You just bring out this new personality that allows that person to kind of escape the stressful situations. There's actually um, been some evaluating the true causes of DID and it's been difficult due to the rarity of the disorder. However, most clinicians believe that the root cause of the disorder is some sort of trauma or even abuse during childhood and the child separated themselves from the abuse and trauma as a way to, quote, deal with the situation, right? And so they continue to do it throughout the rest of their lives because it's just how they know how to deal with stress and trauma. There are some who don't believe DID is an actual disorder and believing the individual may be a con artist or role playing to ease those anxieties in his or her life. So now we'll shift and we're going to talk about personality disorders. So it's kind of, it's really important to have an understanding of the overarching, well, what makes it a personality disorder? Well, it's long standing and it's inflexible personality traits, right? This isn't, I mean, it's always an impairment of the mind, you could say, but it's part of who they are, which doesn't make it less of a mental disorder. It's just very much in who they are that is then disordered. And that impairs their social functioning. There's three clusters. Cluster A exhibits odd or eccentric behavior. Cluster B exhibits dramatic and emotional traits. And then cluster C exhibits anxious or fearful behaviors. So they often seek treatment as at the insistence of others, whether it's a court order, pressure from family members or friends, as the individual is not distressed by his or her condition. They're not distressed by it because it's just who they are, um, but it does cause some dysfunction in their life. So cluster A, there's three types here, and I'm going to run through them fairly quickly um, because you really should be doing more work in class and kind of thinking about these. So paranoid is characterized by paranoia, imagine that, and a pervasive, meaning can't get rid of it, long-standing suspiciousness and generalized mistrust of others, right? And so they're always kind of looking over their shoulder and accusing others of um, kind of having it out for them. Schizoid is a pattern of indifference, right? Not caring. Um, indifference to social relationships with a limited range of emotional expression and experience and that they don't really fluctuate in their emotions at all and really struggle, um, not even struggle because it's not a big deal to them. They just don't have social relationships. It manifests itself by early adulthood through social and emotional detachments and that, you know, you may have like a few year running social relationship with somebody and you're just like, Meh, I'm good and don't really, never really emotionally attached, um, that prevent people from having those close relationships. Whereas schizotypal, really similar um, name there, but is different, is a pattern of social and interpersonal difficulties. And this includes a sense of discomfort with 
close relationships. So schizoid is indifference. Schizotypal is discomfort with those relationships. Eccentric behavior and unusual thoughts and perceptions of reality. So just not really correct in their thinking about others and what others think about them. And the patient usually experiences distorted thinking, behaves strangely, and avoids intimacy. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about paranoid personality disorder. They display, again, pervasive distrust and suspiciousness. And some common beliefs include that others are exploiting or deceiving them. Friends and associates are untrustworthy. So there's a lot of accusations. Information confided to others will be used maliciously. So if they, you know, confide in someone else, tell a secret or something they don't want to tell others, they accuse and say, you're going to use that to come back and bite me, right? There is hidden meaning in remarks or events others perceive as benign and that, well, what did they mean by that? It had to mean something else, but to the extreme. And then oftentimes the spouse or partner is unfaithful. And again, lots of accusations there. Cluster B includes four. We're going to um, quickly run through three here. There's borderline. This is marked by an ongoing pattern of a fluctuation in mood, right? Varying moods, self-image, and behavior. So it's really erratic behavior. These symptoms often result in impulsive actions and problems in relationships. And we're going to talk more about that one. So hang on to that one. Histrionic is characterized by a pattern of excessive attention seeking emotions. So always wanting the attention on them, usually beginning in early adulthood, including inappropriately seductive behavior, right? So they're a little promiscuous sexually and an excessive need for approval, which oftentimes they find that by their seductive behavior. Um, and then narcissistic, you probably have heard of this before, a long-term pattern of abnormal behavior, which is characterized by exaggerated feelings of yourself, self-importance, excessive need of admiration, and a lack of empathy. So I don't care what you're going through because this moment is about me, right? And how great I am or how awful what it is that I'm going through because that's more important than anything else. And again, we can be really accusatory in really all three of these. We might read these and be like, wow, I don't want to deal with that type of person. And I, I wouldn't be able to stand a person like that, which you're not wrong because these people who have these disorders, they are, they're hard to deal with. Um, but we don't want to be judgy in that moment, right? Because it's a disordered behavior. And so we should be thinking of helping them seek treatment so that they can have a more balanced, less dysfunctional life. Borderline pers personality disorder, a little bit more here. Um, a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships. Self-perception, so again, unstable and intense self-perception and moods. Impulse control is markedly impaired. This is why we have this diagnostic criteria of at least five of the following features being required for this diagnosis. So you'll see those impulsivity, um, affective instability, which is emotional instability, oftentimes becoming um, or abusing substances, sexually promiscuous to the extreme, um, inappropriate and intense anger. So a lot of times you see drug abuse with these, with these folks. Now, antisocial personality is the fourth one and is probably the most well-known personality disorder and is one you should really make sure you know about. Clinical features of APD, they must include three of the following. A lack of conforming to laws, as evidenced by repeatedly committing crimes. When you hear antisocial, I don't want you to think of like um, the schizoid or schizotypal personality disorders. I want you to think not, I don't want to be social. I want you to think they shouldn't be social. Okay, so the opposite of antisocial, and you should be just writing this maybe on a post-it note or off to the side somewhere about the meaning of antisocial, because this will be helpful when we talk in social psych. That pro-social behavior, right, is altruism. It's being helpful, right? It is having a positive effect on society. So antisocial being the opposite would be having a negative effect on society, and that it's it's drawing away from or is somehow having a negative effect on the social life of others or yourself. So 
Again, there's no lack of conforming to laws, repeated deceitfulness, right? Lying in relationships with others, using false names, conning others for a profit, Um, failure to think or plan ahead. There's lots of impulsivity, tendency to irritability, anger, and aggression as shown by repeatedly assaulting others or getting into frequent um, physical fights and disregard for personal safety or the safety of others. It's going to be really risky, but they don't care. This disorder can't be diagnosed before someone is 18 years old. To be diagnosed with APD, the individual must have shown symptoms of the diagnosis since 15, since adolescence, and usually the individual has been previously diagnosed in childhood with conduct disorder, and we're going to talk about that as well as another one here in a second. It's more often occurs in males, and sometimes you'll see the term sociopath or psychopath in relation to APD. You should also make a note that these people are incredibly charming They are incredibly deceitful with their intentions and can really easily and effectively fool people um, because that lures them in so that they can do more damage. There's some controversy over um, causes. Some studies suggest genetic predisposition, so possibly in the form of chronic under arousal, both the autonomic and central nervous systems, so that leads to abnormally low anxiousness leaving them less sensitive to punishment. Other research link it to underdeveloped amygdala. Um, And then some believe in the environmental factors like broken homes, rejection by parents, poor discipline, lack of good parental models, um, lack of attachment to early caregivers, those sorts of things. PET scans of 41 murderers revealed reduced activity in the frontal lobes. And in a follow-up study um, report, Repeat offenders had 11% less frontal lobe activity compared to normal brains, which you can see in the scans on the screen here. Um, so we're going to talk more about these two that I've listed in your in your paper notes in neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, But you should note that because these occur in children, they are not and cannot be considered personality disorders. These are neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, And again, we'll talk about them there. So make sure you stay tuned for those notes. Conduct disorder is repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior in which the basic rights of others or major age appropriate norms are violated. So it's essentially antisocial behaviors in a child. Oppositional defiant disorder is not quite as intense or bad as conduct disorder. So it's a frequent and persistent pattern of anger, irritability, arguing, defiance, or vindictiveness toward parents and other authority figures. So conduct disorder is just a little more intense of what bad things they are doing. Whereas oppositional defiant disorder is more about the mood and a little bit of vindictiveness, not as intense as conduct. Finally, we have cluster C. These ones are pretty self-explanatory, but you should make sure that you've got the proper terms here. Avoidant being feelings of extreme social inhibition, right? Like not being able to kind of socially interact. Inadequacy and sensitivity to negative criticism and rejection causing significant inabilities to maintain those day-to-day relationships. So dependent being characterized by the inability to be alone, developing symptoms of anxiety, right? Because cluster C is about those emotional anxious um, feelings when they're not around others, needing constant reassurance from others just to function on a daily basis. Now we've talked about OCD, but there is OCPD which is obsessive compulsive personality disorder. This is characterized by a preoccupation with, so that's kind of the difference there, right? It's not the intrusive thoughts followed by a compulsion. It's a preoccupation and that it's part of who they are and that they think a lot about things like orderliness, perfectionism, mental and interpersonal control at the expense of flexibility, openness, and efficiency, and that they are not flexible at all and are very preoccupied with everything being orderly the way they want. So I hope you find these notes, although it's intense and has a lot of information, make sure you rewind, pause a lot, go back and listen again to things if you missed it. Um, And thank you so much for tuning in. Stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel um, and catch the next video when I get that up and running. Thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.